All right, my friends, and we are live once again for another episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A, taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise to help you be fit and live free. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, happy to have you on board today. Today's episode is sponsored by the entirety here of the Red Delta Project library, but available in paperback, Kindle, and PDF forms. Links to all these are down below because sure, I'm going to be mentioning a lot of my books in today's episode, so you can reference all of those down below. <clears throat> also, apologies for any sort of scratchiness and uh, catches in my voice and stuff. I've been going on. Uh, this is now week three of kind of, uh, I don't know, it's not a cold. It's kind of an infection or something that I've been fighting. So my voice is not as it usually is. It's a little bit less reliable. And uh, we're going to try our best to get through this podcast today without too much irritation to the vocal cords and your eardrums. So apologies up front for anything that can be a little bit rough uh, to hear. So we'll do our best for this. But today's episode is it's always good to get down to the fundamental lessons and important things that we want to address when it comes to achieving your goals, be it losing weight, improving performance, or in today's case, building muscle. And we want to kind of reestablish why this thing actually happens, why it actually works to begin with. Because a lot of us get caught on like dead end streets along the journey to build muscle and strength that can still keep you moving forward and still give you some degree of results, but ultimately makes this whole muscle and strength building thing a heck of a lot less efficient, a lot harder than it needs to be. And ultimately that can handicap your ability to get the results you want and maintain the results you want. So to recap, fundamentally, why do we build muscle and strength? Now, again, most of our fitness culture is based on a method-based approach. If you ask someone, I want to get uh, bigger and stronger, they'll tell you the methods that you should be following. You should lift free weights. You should do five by five. You should do high volume training. You should drink this kind of protein shake on and on and on. Now, this is really good advice, but it's not actually what you need to understand and how to actually build muscle. It's kind of like asking for directions on how to get to a destination like the airport. And all they tell you is what color car you should drive, or you should drive an electric car, or all wheel drive or pickup truck or SUV and stuff. And we get in all these debates of what car is best and all the merits between different vehicles and domestic versus foreign and the Chevy guys and the Ford guys are fighting back and forth. All the while, nobody's actually giving you actual directions on how to get to the damn airport. And that's what a fundamental approach to fitness really does is it says, here's the directions, use whatever method suits you best. Because ultimately, your ability to get bigger and stronger, it doesn't come from your workout routine. It doesn't come from whether you're lifting machines or free weights or bands or whatever. It doesn't come from your diet. It doesn't come from any of that stuff. It comes from understanding how all of those methods and the methods that are best for you influence the fundamental process that is responsible for your outcome. Because remember that fitness fundamentally is a byproduct of mother nature. It is due to the adaptive process that our body is constantly going through 24 seven. And the whole reason why everything in fitness works when it's diet and exercise and stuff is because we understand this natural process that's always going 24 seven entirely on autopilot. And you're basically influencing the speed at which various things happen to go in the direction you want to go in. So what we're talking about with a fundamental process is we have basically like a yin and yang approach to things where we have the yin one side of things where we are creating a stimulus that our body needs to then the other half adapt to adaptation right? now stimulus and adaptation this is again always going on your body is constantly getting exposed to stimuli it's constantly adapting to things 24 7 it never ends and just standing there, moving your hands, snapping your fingers, sitting, standing, climbing stairs, your body evolved in order to adapt and change according to the functional demands it's experiencing every single day. And when we are exercising, particularly to build muscle and strength, we're simply telling it, you need to adapt in order to handle the functional demand of things that require strength and muscular work capacity. That's all we're doing. So when we're looking at that fundamental process of stimulus 
followed by adaptation in an ongoing cycle. That's why your body changes. That's why exercise works. Everything from ping pong to powerlifting works through that process. And the biggest mistake that people make when it comes to trying to get the results they want in anything in fitness, particularly with building muscle, is understanding, even if they know that process, is recognizing that there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of influential variables in that process. You can't say one thing and say, that's why you build muscle. I build muscle because I lift a failure. I build muscle because I lift this program. I build muscle because I consume this supplement or anything. That's not how this works. It's all about this fundamental process. And there are countless variables, some of which you have no control over, some of which you have some control over. And then of course, some that you do have some control over, and that's the things we focus on that you want to pay attention to. However, the big mistake that people make, and we all do this, I've done this many times, we're probably still going to do this again and again to some degree, and that's why I'm making this podcast as a reminder, is we get too focused on a very narrow range of influences, or we get too focused on a single influence and think that's the most important thing, and you put so much time and energy and focus and attention on that one thing that you're neglecting everything else. It's kind of like a, a, a sports coach training and building up one player on the team and ignoring and deconditioning the rest of the players on the team and expecting the team to play well. It's not going to happen. No matter how good you get your diet, no matter how good you get your workout programming, no matter how much weight you put on that bar, you can have any sort of variable or influence maximized like crazy and because it's only one influence, it only carries so much weight on that fundamental process. So some people get caught up. Let me give you some examples on diet, for example. I used to work with a guy who was always trying to optimize and maximize their diet. They're, every day it's like, okay, what if I had casein in the morning or at night? And then if I had whey protein after the workout, but if I was sipping it in the last half of the workout, it's always doing this beautiful mind kind of stuff when it came to his diet. But then I'd ask him, like, how was your workout this morning? And he's like, ah, you know, I just kind of flirted with the girl at the uh, front desk, you know, and the, my, I wasn't really feeling legs today. So I skipped legs and, you know, and I'm like, well, are you tracking your workouts? And he's like, nah, you know, I just kind of do whatever. I'm, I'm, and every week he was like on just some other random program and stuff like that. It's like, dude, it doesn't matter how great you're dialing in your diet. Your workouts suck. And because of that, you've got one influence that's really good, but you got a lot of other things that are basically holding you back. And the best way to get and maintain a good result in anything in fitness is to take, as I always call it, the multi-influential approach, where you're not focusing on any one thing, but you're putting a good amount of effort and attention to a broad range of things. And one, that means you don't have to maximize anything. You don't have to optimize anything, which makes it a hell of a lot easier to keep your habits because the more you try to maximize and optimize anything, the harder it is. You have an exponentially increasing uh, cost to any habit that you're trying to really bolster up to a large degree. And so that's always something we want to keep the cost down. But collectively, all of those habits individually, they may not seem like that big of a deal, but all together, they create a much bigger influential impact on that process, which means you're going to get a much bigger, heavier result. So we're going to be looking today at some of the biggest influences to remind ourselves, what do you need to focus on? What is most important in this muscle and strength building journey that you want to make sure you're checking off those boxes? And so, and, and then looking at what are the things you may be overemphasizing and what are the things you may be neglecting? Because I guarantee you, if you are trying to maximize and optimize one area, diet or how much weight you're on the bar, or your program or whatever, and you're still frustrated with progress, chances are very good. It's not your diet or program or whatever you've been trying to focus on. It's that thing that you've got kind of swept under the rug. The thing that you're like, yeah, you know, it's whatever. I'm not really paying too much attention to that. That's the thing that's probably going to make the biggest difference. And as always, I'll be answering your questions here. Uh, let's see what we've got on the docket. Jerry Hibbard coming on in saying, uh, what are your talk takes on pre-workouts and supplements? I personally think it's a gimmick. Diet is way more important. Well, 
to a degree, supplements are diet. <laughs> you know, it, it can be a component of it. Because always remember that a supplement doesn't do anything different than food. And that's why it can work. Because remember, fundamentally, if something works, that means it doesn't do anything special from the other things that works. And we'll get into this a little bit later on, uh, on why this is the case. But like I build muscle and strength. I do primarily body weight training, calisthenics. And people are like, well, can that work for building muscle and strength? Absolutely. Because it does exactly the same thing as any other form of resistance training. It just subjects the muscle to progressive resistance. So supplements are the same way. And recognizing that, it's like, great, it's nothing special, but that's a good thing. It doesn't, you don't want special, unique, anything that's like, it's totally different than food is totally different than from this type of exercise. If it's totally different, it can't work because the only way it can work is if it does the same thing as everything else. Uh, it's just a bit of a different vehicle, right? We were talking earlier about vehicles. When you are looking at different things, it's like, okay, I need to get to the airport. Does it really matter if you drive a Subaru or pickup truck? No, because you just need to know how to get to the airport. But for you personally, you might be like, but I like all wheel drive. I like having you know, a truck or whatever. Okay, then it matters. But that's more of a personal alignment thing, which we'll get into a little bit. But anyway, so to answer your question, uh, pre-workout, uh, just general caffeine, is usually something I like to go for. I, I like to get uh, some uh, chai or black tea sometimes if I feel I need a little bit of a pick me up, but I'm always consuming that stuff in the, during the day or in the morning anyway. You know, my uh, state of things is always, you shouldn't need anything to get ready to rock and roll in a good workout. Uh, if you do, you need to look at your other influences. You need to look at your sleep. You need to look at your diet. You know, sometimes I'll have people coming into the gym and they're just dragging throughout the workout and they're just, oh, I'm so tired and stuff. I'm like, and then sometimes they'll say like, what about pre-workout? I'm like, sure, it can be a Band-Aid. It can lift you up a little bit, but why are you so tired <laughs> here in the workout? And you shouldn't go into your workout needing this stuff to really ramp up. Um, but yeah, like I said, uh, with diet, with supplements though, it's not bad. I always encourage people, yeah, sure, you know, grab a protein shake, take some creatine. For some people, it can do good things for them especially if it's just making it easier to get what they need. Uh, but uh, it's not going to be anything special or uh, something that's going to uh, make a, a big difference, especially if you've got all your other boxes checked. All of DT saying, hey, Matt, do you still do overcoming isometrics, new discoveries? Absolutely. Uh, of course I do. I've got my uh, ISO strap here. I got my ISO max there and stuff. I've been uh, using a little bit more on isometrics, a little bit more on the yielding side of things uh, where I'm working against some sort of a fixed level of resistance. But oh yeah, absolutely. The thing that's great about overcoming isometrics is they're just so simple and so basic that it's kind of hard or not a good reason not to do them. You just kind of grip and rip for about five, 10 seconds here and there. It's fantastic. Um, I usually find that if my workouts are feeling a little bit stale and I'm like, gosh, I just can't seem to get things moving, then uh, it will be a good way to go uh, forward and ramp things up a little bit. And as far as new discoveries go, I'm putting more attention and finding new uh, benefits in single joint stuff, bicep curls, triceps, things of that nature. Uh, I've always been kind of a little bit on the fence about the importance of single joint stuff in the past. And recently, I've been putting a lot more emphasis on single joint stuff, both with dynamic and isometrics. And I find that it is making a difference in how my physique feels and how my joints feel and stuff like that. So using a single joint uh, overcoming isometrics can be a really good physique and muscle enhancer, especially if you've got a muscle group that's kind of lagging behind a little bit. <clears throat> Mariano, it's good to see you as always, my friend. Saying, hey, Matt, the strategy of training with an objective and eat to satisfy is an effective approach to, man uh, to managing FOMO. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's more of a fundamental approach, my friend. Uh, so he's talking about, uh, you know, fear of missing out because everything out there is about you got to use this method. No, you got to use that method and stuff. But as I was saying earlier, remember that the method you're using really isn't all that important. So if you've got a method that is working really well, then someone's like, well, what about this method? The best you can hope for is something that does the same basic idea, the same thing. I'm testing out a new piece of equipment that's coming out on uh, a Indiegogo uh, campaign. It's a really unique 
uh, resistance training machine and stuff. And it's got all this fancy doodads and gadgets and everything. It's very different from the kind of things that we usually have here on featured on Red Delta Project. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people are like, well, should I be doing that? It's like, well, again, fundamentally, if it works, it's because it does the same thing as everything else. So you're not missing out on anything. But there is always the chance that something may be better for you if it fosters a greater sense of personal alignment. It works better with your resources, your preferences, your schedule, your proficiency and stuff. And in that case, it's just obvious to you. Like when I got into calisthenics training, I basically was like, I like this. Why? It's just a better fit for me. Does it have any inherent advantages for building muscle from free weights and machines and stuff? No, of course not. Because it, it does the same thing. It's just progressive resistance against the muscle. So in that regard, it's like, great, that means it can work, but it worked better for me just because I like the independence. I like the simplicity. I like the fact that I can work out in a park. So in that regard, it was better for me, but of course, that's just me knowing me. <laughs> so sometimes a new method may come around and all you got to do is ask yourself, is it better for me based on just what I know, what I like? Faisal, I'm sorry, man. I keep butchering this name. Faisal. F-A-I-S-A-L-A-L, -A -A <clears throat> excuse me. Hey man, as a newbie who wants to optimize hypertrophy, how do I approach balancing horizontal and pushing vertical push-pull in my routine? Should I be doing both movements in every workout? Two things to unpack here. First and foremost, forget about optimization. Uh, optimization is expensive, my friends. Uh, it's one of those things that is extremely costly to do. Uh, very few people can do any sort of optimized approach for any decent length of time. Because as I said, the more you invest in your diet and exercise habits and stuff, the exponentially more costly things become. You know, th Think of uh, people who are preparing for uh, bodybuilding contests or uh, trying to peak for an athletic event and stuff. That's optimization. And they'll always tell you, it's like, yeah, I'm only going to do this for so long and then psh, I'm going to be done because no one can go to their absolute limit 100% of the time. I heard this quote the other day on social media kind of made me real kind of think about it where the guy was saying nothing in nature goes 100% 100% of the time. You have to bring it back, which means optimization is not practical for long term strategy. You're not going to be optimized. So I'll just put that little bit of uh, a tidbit in there it is like because optimization is impossible to have for a high maintenance uh, sort of approach. It's good in the short term, but have a good reason for it. Like I need an optimal physique. I need an optimal performance for this specific period or time frame, because that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. But you don't need optimization. People think if I'm optimizing things that I'm getting the best results, completely wrong. You're not going to, you're never going to get the best results. If you're always trying to optimize, you're going to get the best results. If you just keep trying to progress and funny enough, if you're always going 100%, you're never going to have as much progression, ironically enough. But anyway, back to the real question you were asking. Uh, vertical push, pull, horizontal on top. Remember, though, that these are fundamental movement patterns. And your muscles should be largely doing the same thing with your fundamental movement patterns. So it doesn't really matter what kind of pulling movement you're doing. Pulling horizontal rowing, single arm rowing, what my hand orientation is and stuff. Fundamentally, your elbows bending, your shoulders extending, your scaps are depressing and retracting and stuff. You're fundamentally doing the same thing. So no matter what pulling exercise you're doing should be essentially working this muscles the same way. It shouldn't be terribly different. If there is a big difference, you need to work on that. Of course, there's always gonna be some difference. I always like to say you're changing the flavor of the exercise. Is so yeah, there is some degree of difference, but it shouldn't really matter. You should be able to do just rows or just pull-ups for the next six months and have the same effect as if you did both. Okay. It's good to mix it up. It's good for variety and you know, just stress is going through the joints and things like that. But when you are looking at mixing the two, however you want to do it, you know, go it with whatever feels strongest for you. If you want to do 90% vertical pulling and just do some rows as like a drop set or something, go for it. Or it could be the other way. You feel like you're much better on rows and stuff. Don't feel like you've got to have this perfect balance between the two. Uh, just basically get whichever ones are feeling you are working best for you. And it's naturally going to ebb and flow between the two uh, for what is going to be more uh, 
accommodating your body and your needs. Uh, some people, they like to include both in the same workout. Some people switch back and forth, however you want to do it. As I would say, as long as you're getting both to any degree, you're probably covering your bases. You don't need to worry too much about, you know, what the ratio between the two is. Let's get one more question and then we'll get right back onto today's topic. Zay Decker, hey, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming on by saying, hey, Matt, how do I balance skill work like front lever, which requires less fatigue in muscles with uh, getting aesthetic, uh, aestheticals, which may require more fatigue? Very good question because you're 100% right. When we are going after skill, we are not quite as focused on fatiguing our body. In fact, we don't want to fatigue it very much, largely because we are trying to get practice in and you're not going to get much practice if you are highly fatigued. So what you want to do is do the skill work at the beginning of your workouts when you're fresher and you can basically push yourself as well as possible. Then when you start to notice your fatigue is starting to mount up and your muscles are starting to burn out, then you switch gears like in grind style calisthenics to the quote hypertrophy and the fast and the burnout stuff. So then you would do your, your rows, your pull-ups, your curls and things like that. Like let's say, for example, you're working on the skill of a front lever. So you go through a little bit of a warm up, some tension control exercises, maybe a little shifting, lat activation and stuff. Then you do your front lever. And again, I do adaptive programming style. So whatever sets and reps you feel you can get for the day, you know, you just keep practicing it, working on the skill of the front lever, keeping fatigue a little bit at bay. And once you feel yourself starting to burn out, could be after two sets, could be after 20, who knows. But once you feel that fatigue start to build up, depending on your circumstances, then you change gears into the you know, the hypertrophy stuff, the stuff that's burning you out. And that way you can have your cake and eat it too. So yeah, we're talking about our fundamental approach. We've got a stimulus, then we've got an adaptation. So the stimulus is where we want to put most of our attention because that's the thing that you want to have more control over. As I'll get into a little bit later on, your adaptation, that's going to happen largely on autopilot. You really don't need to worry about that very much. Your adaptation, your recovery, all that sort of thing, you basically just don't need to get in your own way for that. You don't need anything to adapt and recover because that's going to happen anyway. If you cut your hands, you don't go online going like, how in the world do I heal my hands? It's like, it's going to happen automatically. You know, don't keep picking at the scab or slamming it in the car door to prevent it from doing anything, you know, from healing in a good way. But for the most part, you don't need to worry about the second half of that process. It's going to happen anyway. But when it comes to the stimulus, that's where we want to focus on doing something. Now, a lot of times people will say, okay, so what kind of workout, what kind of exercise, what kind of, you know, ex uh, training methodologies and stuff am I using? It's really, really simple. All you need is some sort of method that allows you to apply progressive resistance against your muscles whatever that is it can be what you know bands rocks lifting small children you know whatever you want when i was in japan and living with the host family i lifted the three and five year old uh, uh son and daughter of the host family i was with that was my weight lifting and it worked you know because they kept getting bigger so i kept getting stronger it was a milo of croatia kind of thing but uh, when i was working on trying to build myself up. I was always looking at what kind of program and stuff. You just need a method that has progressive resistance, it, whatever that is. And then just use whatever suits your tastes, your preferences, your, your abilities and stuff. And that's what you want to make sure that when you're looking at whatever method you're looking at, you want to be able to get that progressive resistance pretty reliably. You don't want to have like a pair of 15 pound dumbbells or a single kettlebell. And you're saying to yourself, okay, there's my strength training program. It's like, well, you've got some degrees of progression there, but you're kind of limited. I've always kind of in the back of my mind thought I want a weight machine with the ability to go from like five pounds to 500 pounds. I want a big range of resistance. I want a lot of potential progression with whatever method I'm using. So that's the first thing is use that for a method. Second is consistency in your applications, because ultimately we are trying to progressively work our muscles. And that's a lot easier to do when you just get better at the exercises to begin with. There's this idea out there in our fitness culture of, oh, you don't want your muscles to get used to the exercise. You don't want it to get used to the workout program and everything like that. That's full on completely flat out wrong. Uh, you want to get used to the exercise. You want it to happen as quickly as possible. You want it to happen uh, to a very high degree because the only chance you're going to have 
for that progression to even occur is getting used to the exercise and the program. Because if you never get used to it, you can't progress. Think of anything else in your life where you were learning a musical instrument or something in school or some sort of skill or a trade. You start off with a couple of basic techniques and you can't move on until you get comfortable and used to using those basic techniques. And the same thing goes with strength training. You want to get really, really, really used to it. And then you can move forward and progress. And then when it comes to progression, remember, there's three zones of progression. There's training volume and time. So how much are you doing? There's intensity. So how much tension are you putting in your muscle? And then lastly, there's proficiency, which for most methods that we're using for strength training, we have the um, ability to basically control, controlling the weight, controlling our body, bigger range of motion, not you know struggling underneath the level of resistance, but having more of a, a ability to dominate and own the exercise, if that makes any sense for you. Okay, let's get into a couple other questions here before we move on. Master Dave is saying, how do you continue to stay on the path when traveling, being in hotels and stuff, or renting uh, cheap rooms? Well, it's pretty easy for me because I'm a bodyweight guy. <laughs> so you're looking at my gym uh, right here. All I need is a place to hang and the floor beneath my feet. And if I don't have the floor beneath my feet, I've got bigger problems. But it's uh, pretty easy in that regard. So obviously some methods are more portable than others. You know, if you're a power lifter, it's kind of hard to haul a barbell and a lot of weights in a rack on an airplane, right? So you're looking at going to gyms, you know, seeing what is around the area that you can use. Uh, you want to maybe plan a little bit ahead, uh, seeing uh, what resources you may have in the environment you're going to. Generally, I find when people are like, well, I'm traveling on vacation, it's not something I, I encourage them to really worry about too much because it's like, yeah, I go on vacation once a year or so for like a week or 10 days. Nine times out of 10, I'm usually telling them, just don't worry about it. You know, just get in some pushups, go for a walk on the beach. 10 days, it's not going to do anything. Just stay active uh, to uh, feel good on the vacation, but take, take some time off. You know, maybe go for uh, some hard workouts for several weeks beforehand. So you kind of need the rest or deserve the rest, so to speak, but don't worry about it. It's too short. However, some people, they travel a lot for work. They're traveling every month. They're away, you know, one or two weeks uh, every month, in which case, when it's that frequent, you definitely want to have some sort of methods that are much more reliable to you. In which case, you know, my handy suspension straps, very gym or, and uh, hotel friendly. You can use them in a doorway and stuff. And uh, again, body weight training is very good. And lastly, I'll, I'll always typically tell people like adaptive training methods are extremely effective when traveling. I get this or used to get it. I don't get it so much anymore, but clients used to ask me all the time. They're like, okay, can you give me a program when I'm on vacation? Can you give me something to do? And I'll accommodate. I'm like, sure, I can give you a couple of workouts. Why not? I can definitely do that. But in all honesty, I know you're not going to do it. You know, no one ever does a workout program when they're on vacation that I give them. Uh, largely because, again, a program that's set in stone requires a certain amount of time and energy and resources. And when we're traveling, especially to a new place in a new environment, we're going into a set of circumstances. We don't know what time we have. We don't know what energy we're going to have. We don't know what resources we're going to have. So it's like trying to crystal ball this sucker and knowing what we can do. So that's why I usually adopt, take more of a freestyle adaptive approach. It's like, just do whatever you like, be fun, have play, fun with it, you know, be playful, go down to the hotel gym and like, well, this is an unusual weight machine. I'll just play around with this and see what I can do. It doesn't need to be much, uh, but uh, don't try to be too rigid about it. Christopher, it's good to see as always, my friend. Saying, hey, Matt, what's your opinion on the mental aspect of training, visualizations, affirmations, self-talk, et cetera? Do you have such practices? Absolutely. Because always remember, my friends, training the body is easy. It's very easy because it will do whatever your brain tells it to do. It's training your brain that's the hard part. And so those sorts of practices, visualizations, affirmations, things like that are essentially mental and emotional training practices. Your body is going to be a reflection of the thoughts in your head and the feelings in your heart. And if you're not trying to discipline and train those to be bigger and stronger, there's no way in hell your body's going to get bigger and stronger because it's always a reflection of that. So those 
visualizations, affirmations, and stuff like that are very, very key. This is something I've been getting into a lot more just recently, like the past several days. And one of the things that I've learned is that I know sometimes we've, we may have practiced some sort of affirmations or self-talk and stuff, and it doesn't seem to work. If anything, your body kind of, or your mind rejects it. Like you could uh, be telling yourself, I'm the strongest guy in the gym. I'm so awesome at pull-ups. I'm the best in the world at calisthenics. But then that little voice in the back of your head goes, yeah, right. What are you talking about? And it does the opposite effect where you're actually emotionally reinforcing you're not that. So what do you do? Well, you do the exact same thing you do when you're working with physical resistance with your body. You don't go in to the gym, especially when you're starting out and being like, okay, 500 pound deadlift, here we go. No, because if anything, again, if you overload your body, then you're creating more of a fight or flight response and your body's actually going to resist changes in adaptation by creating, you know, soreness, uh, injury, aches, pains, loss of motivation. You know, these are consequences of your body trying to avoid the very stimulus you're trying to create. So you do the same thing with your self-talk and visualizations. You don't go, I'm the best calisthenics master in the world because that's like going and lifting too heavy a weight. You don't, it's too much, but you could say, you know, I'm making some pretty good progress in my pull-ups or man, my grip is feeling a lot stronger these days. It's not as big of a, a resistance, right? You don't have as much resistance towards internalizing, believing and feeling that. So that's why it actually works to build you up just a little tiny bit. And then you can be like, okay, yeah, I'm actually starting to become kind of a badass with my grip these days. And it just builds up from there. So you got to start with whatever you can believe and then you build yourself up. But the bottom line is hundred percent. Not only is it a good thing to do, I'm getting to the point where I'm kind of believing it's essential. You need to build the mind and the heart in order to build the body. Because if the heart and the mind are weak, and they're subdued, and they're not able to handle much resistance, your body's going to follow suit uh, for sure. So that's a good thing to recognize when it comes to creating that stimulus for building muscle is always work with a level, as I tell my clients all the time, challenge, but don't struggle. Because a lot of times, especially with progressive calisthenics, there's a level of resistance you can exhibit upon your muscles through just changing your body position where you can quickly go from, I've got this, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to uh, do a real hard struggle. When you go to a struggle state, it's a little bit of an overload. So don't worry about how much are you lifting. Don't worry about how many reps you can do. Don't worry about, you know, whether or not you can do a one-arm push-up stuff. Not important. Honestly, seriously, it's not. You want to find whatever level that you can work at that's going to challenge your muscles but not make you struggle at it. And I know that's kind of a little subjective. It doesn't give you exactly the, the hard numbers and stuff like that, but you'll get a feel for it pretty quick through just experience. And when you do that, it doesn't matter if you're doing countertop pushups or one arm pushups. If you're challenging your muscles and they're getting progressively worked over time, so they're working a little harder, a little bit more uh, time under tension, that sort of thing, you're gonna get bigger and stronger muscles regardless of how many reps you're doing and how much weight you're lifting. It's the progression. It's the difference. It's the change. It's the, um, <clears throat> it's the delta that you create in your workouts. That's what's important. That's the thing that makes you stronger. Not exactly, you know, how many reps you're doing or how much weight you're lifting. Back to some questions. My man, Joseph Bello. Good to see you. Saying, hey, I was thinking of doing an A, B, A and B workout, push-up, squat variant, tricep exercise day one on one day. B, uh, workout B would be pull-ups, pike push-up, bicep curl, hamstring on glute exercise. What do you think? Well, how? what are you spreading these out with? So are you doing A, B, A, B, A, B like every other day kind of thing? Are you doing it on like a, every other week, you know, very classically uh, powerlifters will do this where they'll have like Monday, Wednesday, Friday workouts. So week one will be A, B, A, and then workout will be B, A, B. So that's usually a pretty good way of going about it. it. Depends on the frequency of those things. I'm always a big fan of whatever training program that you like. The bottom line with a program that gets it effective is just, can you get in the work? That's all it needs to be. 
Yeah. I don't care how you're doing your pushups in your program. You could be doing a B split. You could be doing full body workout. You could be doing push pull. You could be doing working the right side of the body versus the left side of the body. I mean, you could mix it up any way that you like, but the bottom line is, are you getting your pushups in? <laughs> are you doing your pull-ups? If that's all, if you are, then it's good because <laughs> that's the only real job a workout program has is to basically get you pointed in the right direction and just stabilize you, meaning something that you can stick to. That's all you need from a program. If you're pointing in the right direction, you're working your muscles progressively against heavy resistance and you can maintain it, your workout's as good as it's going to ever get because <laughs> those are the only two fundamental principles that a good workout program needs to have. The rest is just details. And that, again, goes for more of a personal alignment thing. So give it a shot. Go for it. Yeah. But do be bear in mind, a lot of times when people are splitting their workouts up, they're think, okay, if I'm doing like push one day and then pull and then I go right into push, then my muscles on my push chain are resting while I'm working my pull chain and vice versa. And yeah, the muscle tissue itself may be resting, but don't forget that training, physical training itself can have systematic stress that built up in the body. So we do need to give ourselves some more rest and recovery if the overall stress and uh, fatigue in the body as a whole, your nervous system and everything is still building up because everything in the body is connected. So on that pull day, you may be like, yeah, my push muscles are resting. Well, not entirely. Some of them are still working synergistically. Eva. Saying, hey, Matt, Eve here. Eva, I'm struggling to progress with my push-ups. Very good. Feel weak at the bottom position. Absolutely. Trying um, uh, OISO and regression on knees, uh, but not yet seeing much progress. Any tips? Well, how long have you been doing it for? Uh, that's the first thing I would ask. And sometimes progress can take several weeks to, to kick in. But uh, usually when people are struggling uh, with any sort of progress, uh, nine times out of 10, it's a lack of neuromuscular proficiency. You're not using your muscles well enough. Uh, don't make the assumption that exercise will make you stronger. It won't. Exercises do not do much of anything at all. You're not going to build muscle and strength because you do push-ups any more than you do it with bench press or lifting rocks because the exercise is only the application of what does make you bigger and stronger, which is your, how you're using your muscles. Your muscles are what you're using. Your muscles are what you're concentrating on engaging. That's the point of your training. Again, from ping pong to powerlifting, I don't care what you're training for. I don't care how you're doing. I don't care what your goals are. The entire point of all forms of physical training is how well are you using your muscles? And when you think, oh, it's about doing this exercise or that or anything like that, you're missing the point. Again, you're, you're focusing too much on what kind of car should I drive to the airport when you don't know how to drive to the airport? You don't know the directions. So focus on these key areas with your pushups. One, are your shoulders packed at the bottom? So at the bottom of a push-up position, are you avoiding the hunch? So at the bottom, your shoulders should be away from the floor as much as possible and away from your ears. The push-up hunch does the opposite, where your shoulders come up and forward like this. Push-up hunch. You line up 100 people on the street, tell them to do push-ups. You're probably going to have the hunch and 99 of them. And even the other guy's probably going to have it eventually if he keeps doing push-ups. So avoid the push-up hunch. That alone can probably make a very big difference. Second of all is be aware of how you're gauging your progress in general. So this goes along with what I was saying earlier, where I was saying that the big mistake people make when it comes to their training is they get too fixated on a single influential variable. And when it comes to progress, that happens a lot, especially when it comes to training. I'm not making progress in my pushups. What do you mean? Well, I can't do, you know, I can do 15 pushups and I can still only do 15 pushups. Okay, great. Well, how's your shoulder position? How's your elbow position? How's your speed? How's your tempo? Oh, that all is improving like crazy. That's going great. Okay, then you're making progress in your pushups. You're just not making progress yet in that one area. Happens a lot with people on, you know, weight, weight loss journeys. I'm not making any progress. Why not? Well, the scale still reads the same thing. Well, how's your diet? Oh, it's awesome. I feel so much better. How are your clothes fitting? Much looser. I'm down like two loops or two uh, notches on my belt. How you, how's your performance in the gym? Oh, great. Wonderful. I'm going. It's like everything else is improving, but your weight, yet you think you're not making progress because you're judging your progress by one single metric. 
take a more overall approach because I guarantee you're probably making progress if you're implementing other strategies to it. Um, and uh, finally, uh, just make sure you're breathing. <laughs> That's a big killer with calisthenics. So if you're holding your breath and you're really killing, kicking in that Vesalva maneuver, uh, that's just going to make you really tired and makes it harder to progress in general. Leroy, the man. Zane, we may not see eye to eye. I hope not. If someone agrees 100% with me, then they're not thinking for themselves, but I know what you mean on this one. But if muscle gains are difficult, I think bulking is a good solution. Strength comes in fast linearly, which can result in better gains. Uh, main gaining is hard for Natty. So first and foremost, recognizing, yeah, you know, people are often like, you know, I'm a hard gainer. I'm a hard gainer. Like, yeah, you and 99% of everyone else. Building muscle is really flipping hard. It's always hard. You know, you've got the genetic freaks out there who can look at a dumbbell and put on five pounds of muscle, but especially because there's so many messages in our fitness culture telling you like, oh, you should put on X amount of weight and muscle, you know, in this amount of time and stuff and newbie gains and stuff. But the fact of the matter is most people are always going to struggle to put on any muscle at all under any circumstances. Hell, even on steroids. I've known people who literally go on steroids and they're like, I'm still not building muscle. How is this happening? Granted, they're probably more of an exception, but the fact of the matter is building muscle is hard. It's always hard. It's always going to be hard. It's never going to be easy. And the sooner you recognize that, funny enough, the easier it's going to become. <laughs> Don't believe the messages that make it seem like it should be happening faster and easier than it really should because building muscle is a lot harder, it's a lot slower, and it's a lot more difficult than a lot of folks out there will kind of have you believe, especially as you get more advanced in your training career. Now, you're, you mentioned the bulking. Now, when, uh, the reason why I don't encourage bulking is because it's done without any point to it. You know, whenever we're training or we're eating without an objective, you're basically just throwing effort into the wind, crossing your fingers and hoping you're going to get successful through dumb luck, which is not a game I like to play. And it's basically work harder and hope for the best kind of thing. Always have an objective to your diet and your exercise habits. The more you can achieve a fundamental objective in what you're doing, the better your results will be. Bulking usually does not have an objective. It's just do more, <laughs> do more. It's basically greed, you know, in another manifestation. You know, how will you get successful in life? Just make a lot more money. Well, how much is enough? Just always more. When you don't have an objective you're trying to hit, you're never going to be successful because you don't have a point to what you're doing. So a lot of times when people bulk, they're just trying to eat a lot more. Let's be honest, they're not really lifting that much heavier, you know, nine times out of 10, they're not doing anything different in the gym. Technically they should be, but most of the time when I run into people and like, I'm bulking, what does that mean? I'm just eating a whole lot, you know, particularly if they're doing like a dreamer bulk, you know, if you've ever heard of a dreamer bulk, which is basically you just pig the F out like crazy junk food, like crazy. You basically have the worst diet imaginable and yeah, you're going to definitely get bigger. But the reason why they call it a dreamer bulk is because if you think that any of that weight or even appreciable amount of that weight is muscle, you're dreaming, <laughs> you're getting fatter. And that's why I always mention this to people is when people are asking about food, because we could talk about that with recovery and stuff and adaptation. I'm always telling people, you've got to eat. That's the whole point of eat to satisfy the entire dietary strategy. It doesn't matter if you're building muscle or not here at Red Delta Project. You should be eating lots of food, really good food, regardless of what your objectives are, because food is a very good thing. And feeding your, yourself is a very good thing. And the point of a diet for anybody should be to eat to satisfy your needs. And sometimes when we're trying to build muscle, we need to eat more. And it's not because you're building muscle. It's just because you created a higher caloric demand. You know, when I got into bike racing in college, my diet exploded. I went from eating 2,500, 3,000 calories a day to almost 6,000 calories a day. But no one ever said you've got to bulk or eat a lot or be in a caloric surplus to be a bike racer. It's just, dude, you're burning calories like crazy. You basically can't eat enough practically under those circumstances. And um, that's basically the thing. So always remember that when it comes to diet, if you're getting fatter, you're eating more than you need to. 
it's kind of like back in the day when you know, everybody was like, oh, you got to drink lots of water, drink lots of water, drink lots of water, eat, drink, make sure you're drinking this much. And everybody's like double fisting water bottles at their desk at work and everything. And then people were asking me, they're like, but I got to take a piss like every 20 minutes. I'm like, yeah, you're drinking too much water. You're consuming water. Your body's like, dude, I've got enough. Stop. You know, I got to get rid of it or something. And that's just a food thing. That's how food actually works. So coming back to building muscle and stuff, should you eat more? No way to know. There, it's impossible for me to know because I don't know what you're eating right now. So I always encourage people, definitely eat more. If you're, if you're curious about it, you know, add in a few hundred extra calories and stuff. It can make a big difference. And there are people out there who definitely need that. Is I, I grew up with a fairly stable diet, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, square meals, snacks, that sort of thing. But I knew people who I had a roommate in college. He would literally go for days not eating anything. He'd just live off of Lipton iced teas. You know, you'd get these sweetened iced teas and that's all he would consume for three days. And then he got into strength training and he's like, I'm not building any muscle. I'm like, dude, because you're not eating. You've got to eat more you know, because it's just it's that simple. You're not eating enough. But if you are putting on a decent amount of fat, yeah, it's not doing you any good uh, eating even more beyond that. Your body can only use so much. If you can use more, eating more helps. No, that's not bulking. That's called eating enough. And you should always be trying to do that. That's the other thing about bulking that I, I don't really agree with. It's a limited time frame. Like if you're trying to build muscle, whatever you do to build the muscle should always be done. Okay. It shouldn't be a short time frame. It shouldn't be I do this for six months or six weeks or whatever. Because my approach with, with uh, diet and exercise has always been, if I can't always do it, I'm not interested. Unless I'm happy with a temporary scenario. You know, because if you have to have a certain amount of food and calories and work out a certain way to build muscle, and then you're stopping that strategy because the bulk is over, you're going to lose that muscle when you're no longer doing that thing. Because that's how food in the human body works. You remove the stimulus, you're going to lose whatever that stimulus was creating for you. So again, a bulk is usually a temporary thing, which is another reason I don't like it. So if you're like, I ate more and I built muscle, good. You should be eating like that all the time. Don't make it a temporary thing. That's how you're supposed to eat. You just weren't eating enough to begin with. If your caloric demand goes down, then yes, definitely eat less. But that's, again, not a bulk or a cut or anything. That's just simply called eating appropriately. But anyway, uh, thank you very much in on there. So we're talking diet and stuff. Yeah, you should already, always be eating enough to recover. It, you shouldn't have to eat a, a certain way to build muscle. You should just eat in a healthy way. And if you need more, then you should automatically be eating more because you're hungrier and you're eating more because of it. Zaid uh, coming again saying, can you make an updated front lever tutorial? Oh my gosh, yes. That is so old. The one I have on there, I should probably even take it down. It's probably just really outdated information at this point. I'll see what I can do for you uh, when I get back to the calisthenics gym because I've got some new techniques and things uh, that I've been implementing. Been making a, a, a de decent amount of progress with it. Lex. Leo, consistency, practice, practice, you will get better. Absolutely. Remember, you are practicing how to use your muscles whenever you're training. doesn't matter what you're training for. It is practice. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to improve your ability to use your muscles. But don't keep doing the same thing. Remember, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. You're only reinforcing whatever habits you have. So if you have bad technique, you are reinforcing bad technique. So you're practicing for the a purpose of proficiency and progression. Don't just assume that doing, you know, a thousand pull-ups is going to make you bigger and stronger because it could make you weaker if you're reinforcing bad habits. Sindar, uh, Sinitar is coming on saying, hey Matt, is trying to develop skills, strength, hypertrophy, and endurance. Can they be done during the same workout? Should you do different workouts for each uh, attribute? Yeah, like I was saying earlier, the grind style approach that we have works very well for that. Because you put your strength stuff first and your, your skills, same thing, strength is a skill. And then you have your hypertrophy, aka endurance stuff uh, afterwards. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. It can definitely be done in the same uh, workout when you're basically doing uh, 
both where you're focusing on strength and skill first, then you're burning yourself out. You're going to get it all at once. So Raphael saying, what do you think about having a uh, uh, same rep target? Do it every day, like a uh, uh, thousand dips, 500 pull-ups. Can't I build muscle through high reps? Absolutely. You can build muscle doing anything. So when it comes to creating a stimulus for hypertrophy, there's still a lot we don't know. It, it, honestly, like anybody who really is up on their stuff about the science of building muscle will tell you, we're not really sure how and why the body builds muscle. You know, it used to be back in the day, it's like, oh, you tear down the muscle and then it builds itself back up through protein synthesis and stuff. Now that's a lot more questionable uh, because there's certainly lots of instances where you can tear down a muscle through exercise. And yes, you have an increase in synthesis and yes, it's building itself back up. And then when it gets back to baseline, it often stops. There's no net gain a lot of times because you're only going to build if you have that super compensation. And the best way that we can basically try to tell our body to have that super compensation is, again, through that progressive functional demand. We tell the body, I need you to do something beyond what you're normally used to. Just a tiny little bit. That's all you need. So when we have these rep targets and stuff, uh, that can be a little bit of a dogmatic prison you can find yourself in. You're not going to build muscle if you do 1,000 pull-ups. You're not going to do build muscle if you do 500 dips. Because all you're doing now is you're basing your workouts on how much work you do. And no, your success does not depend on how much work you do. It depends on how well you improve and progress over time. So if your goal is to do a certain amount of work, again, you're focusing on the vehicle. You're focusing on, should I have an all wheel drive vehicle if I wanna to get to the airport? Sure, fine, you can do that if you want, but that's not why you're gonna to get to the airport. You're not gonna get there because you drive a Subaru. You're basing it on the method that you have. So I usually don't like having rep targets like that because that implies that you're going to have a certain amount of time and energy that you can always spend in your workouts. And that's, again, crystal balling this sucker. You're guessing and assuming what you should be doing in your workouts according to your circumstances versus an adaptive approach is like use what you got. You know, sometimes you may find you need more than that. You can do more than that. And sometimes you could be like, dude, I already sufficiently created a stimulus for hypertrophy in like 20 pull-ups. The rest is just junk volume. The rest is just eating into your recovery. You're just working for the sake of work. At that point, it's manual labor. Might as well just go out and dig ditches. So we're trying to work our muscles to get stronger. But more importantly, as the science now kind of heavily suggests, burn out the muscle. Challenge your muscular work capacity. Get it to the point where your muscles are really kind of struggling to continue working to a good degree. That seems to be what the science is suggesting is the main stimulus driver for hypertrophy. Do that however you want, whatever reps, whatever sets, whatever exercises you like. If you get that, that's probably going to be the main driver for the stimulus for hypertrophy. Don't focus too much on how much work you're doing because that's not nearly as important. Super Prime 117, it's good to see you. Hey, Matt, what's the best way to specifically train stability for target muscle? I'd be willing to bet that it's uh, quasi isometrics, but I'm not sure. So always remember that stability is about the synergistic use of many muscles. It's never going to be from one muscle. The more you try to focus on creating stability from one muscle, like your glutes, the more you're not still going to be stable because you have hip stability from your glutes and your adductors and your abductors and your quads and your hamstrings and your calves. Hey, same thing in your shoulders. If I'm, you know, doing push-ups and my shoulders are hunching up, it's my lats, it's my traps, it's my rhomboids, it's to some degree even a little bit in the chest. So stability is a lot of different muscles. So don't think so much stability is about muscles so much as it is about the synergistic use of a collection of muscles. And that's why we use chain training here at Red Delta Project, getting things to work together as a cohesive unit. And that's where you're going to be uh, having the most stability with things. Burgon Journey is saying, hey coach, I stopped training for 60 days. Any ideas on how to regain, uh, add more gain to stubborn body parts like front shoulder and the neck? Uh, so, okay, so I'm assuming there's two parts to this. One, when you're getting into it, just do whatever you can for right now. Just get the ball rolling. You may get down on the floor and be like, I don't have a lot of motivation or energy to do much for push-ups. Like fine, get five. 
do 10. Well, I could do more than 10. Okay, then do, do whatever. Just do whatever you can because that's how training just always works. You know, whenever I go and hit the playground or the gym, I'm just doing whatever I can trying to improve upon it. That's all you're doing now as well. Don't make the mistake of trying to like catch up to your previous numbers and progress and stuff. Your circumstances are different now. You're trying to, you know, base your workout again on a different set of circumstances of what you have. That's when you create misalignment. Uh, and stubborn areas, you know, Arnold said it best, you know, work that thing. <laughs> if you're Glutes are stubborn to grow, work your glutes. If your neck is stubborn to grow, you work your neck. We were talking earlier about single joint stuff. If you're having trouble getting an area to work, first off, make sure you're engaging it well. And second of all is use exercises that create a lot of emphasis on that. It could be single joint stuff. It could be uh, isometrics. It could be whatever. But you want to bring more emphasis into that area with whatever exercise that you like. Last couple here, folks, before we wrap stuff up. Super Prime 117 saying, what are the difference in benefits eccentrics uh, provide versus isometrics for the muscles and connective tissue like tendons? I heard isometrics would be better because eccentrics give uh, more soreness. Yeah, the, the uh, eccentrics certainly do create more soreness because basically you're ripping the muscle apart, um, especially if you're going into an elongated position, like a stretched out position. Uh, so you're basically trying to contract your muscle and you're tearing it apart. It's kind of like if you, you know, held your arm like this in a bicep curl and you had a friend come and just wrench your arm as hard as it could, that's going to create more damage because you're physically trying to tear apart your muscles. You're physically trying to tear things apart. And again, it used to be much more popular where people liked that a lot because I thought that muscle damage was heavily correlated with hypertrophy. Now we're not exactly so sure. It may still have a role, but maybe not too strong. The jury is still out on that one. Um, but uh, I guess the, the big question is um, for what? What are you, what are you uh, doing sort of thing uh, with this? Let me revisit this question. Uh, I mean, tendons are just strong in general. I always tell people, don't worry about strengthening tendons. They're already stronger than they're ever going to need to be. If you have soreness in a tendons because a muscle is not engaging somewhere properly, you never really need to strengthen your tendons. Um give off more soreness. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're answering the question right there is, um, you know, your soreness is not going to help you. Remember soreness is a consequence of training, but it's not the goal of our training. You're not going to build muscle because you get sore, uh, but it, it is fun to get sore. It, it, as a friend of mine once put it very well, you get sore because you subject your body to a novel stimulus. You build muscle because you subject it to an effective stimulus. And sometimes the two can be one and the same, but they're correlation versus causation. Adamoto is saying, hey, Matt, what can I do about one higher hip uh, due to years of carrying a bag over one shoulder? I think uh, higher hip. Yeah. Is there an exercise that you recommend? Yeah. Basically, you want to just try to get level again. You know, I had the same thing, you know, carrying a bag over one shoulder, that shoulder was chronically elevated. So when I'm doing my pull-ups and my rows and my curls and stuff, just making sure that sucker's down, being aware of your hips. Are they square to the floor or are they elevated? Being aware of that imbalance and just simply don't foster that imbalance anymore. You probably don't need to do anything special. It's more of just have more of an awareness of when you are tilting and don't tilt. <laughs> I know it's a very simple thing, but always remember, my friends, the fundamental stimulus of training literally is you telling your body what you want it to do. And a lot of times that literally comes down to, I keep doing this in my workout. What do I do? Don't do it. <laughs> keep trying not to do it. Or how do I get more reps? Try doing more reps. Remember, training is trying. When you are trying to do something, that is literally what creates your stimulus for what you are trying to do. All right, last one here. <clears throat> Brian saying, between handstand push-ups, uh, regular push-ups and dips, which is the most balanced in targeting all the push chain muscles? Probably the standard push-up, I would say. Uh, I mean, dips are basically push-ups, so they're pretty well balanced as well. Handstands, you're a little bit more emphasis on the shoulder. Again, we're changing the flavor here, folks. Does it really matter which ones that you're doing? Probably not. Not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, you know, I 
built my shoulders up a bit more, focusing more on handstand push-up, but that's just because I put more emphasis on the shoulders. But uh, I usually use dips and push-ups interchangeably. Yeah, in my mind, fundamentally, they're the same exercise. They're just a different flavor. They don't really work the body in a totally different way, or at least they shouldn't. And if they are for you, you're probably doing something to make that happen on your end. It's not the exercise. Remember, you're the one using your muscles. The exercise is just the application. All right, questions coming in very quickly here, folks, but I've got to start running here. <clears throat> Max D saying, want to thank you. Made uh, me the trainer, trainee at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, we all are. You know, we're, we're all doing both at the same time here, my friends. But uh, just to kind of recap, put a pin on it sort of thing. When it comes to the fundamental approach to building muscle, remember, we've got a stimulus, we've got adaptation. Fundamentally, the stimulus you're trying to create is progressive workload on the muscle, challenging our muscular workload. You could do that with any method, any program, any exercise, any tools that you like. Just make the muscles work progressively harder over time and uh, have consistency in getting uh, the muscles to be working harder and longer, basically challenge your muscular work capacity. And then of course, through adaptation, that's when you get bigger and stronger and basically sleep well, eat plenty of good food, give yourself whatever time you need to recover. I'm always telling people just recover as needed. If you need five days, give yourself five days. If you need 48 hours, whatever kind of thing, don't be too dogmatic about it. Again, adaptive training affords you that. There's more on that in my book, Micro Workouts. Uh, it allows you to actually do what you need to do, not what someone else thinks you need to do in some sort of a dogmatic approach. And uh, when it comes to building muscle, remember that most of it is completely on autopilot, that all we need to do is just light the match by creating that sort of stimulus. And it is hard. It is very difficult. Uh, it's, pro it's usually a lot harder than people will often make it out to be and harder than we expect. But if you just keep on consistency and you stay focused on that fundamental process and creating the objective of creating the stimulus through muscular work capacity, you're on your way right as rain. So thanks so much, everybody, for coming on in. I'm glad my voice held up as well as it did, but I can tell it's starting to get a little bit crazy in the back. But uh, I will talk to you folks next week. Till then, be fit and live free.